little while. The last full district event that we partook of was Men's Conference of 2020. And they shut us down. They might have told us to stay home. They might have told us to not gather together in a one building, but I can promise you there were some homes that were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost on those Sundays and here in those midweek small groups. But I'm excited to see a house full of individuals that still believe in the power of the name of Jesus.
would speak into every situation, that you would speak into every life. I pray that you would speak to everyone that has a diagnosis and everyone that's facing a financial challenge and everyone that's facing a family challenge tonight. In the name of Jesus, let the Holy Ghost descend upon this district. On this family night service, I pray, let it inaugurate what you're going to do over the next several days in this house, God. The Lord, when we leave here tonight, let us know that we have heard from you with faith for what the future holds knowing that you are putting your hand upon us for whatever it is to come. We don't know what's going to happen in Ukraine. We don't know what's going to happen even in our own lives in the next several days. But we do know that we are in a moment right now where we can take advantage of your presence, where we can take advantage of your word, and we can begin to walk in the anointing that's going to carry this for If it's in the wilderness, I'll go. If it's in the temptation, I'll go. If it's in the trial, I'll go. The Lord that Greatest 
greatest of all prophets, as he was going to be called there in the future. If you sum up everything that he said, he only ever said, he only ever preached a few things. Because his message, while it was powerful, and while it was pointed, and while he held nothing back when he preached, he simply preached this message. Repent and get ready, for there's somebody who is coming. His message was repent and be ready. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. My job is not to be that one, but there is coming one who is mightier than I. And I, I'm not even fit to, to tie his shoes, but there is one coming. And, and I baptize you with water. Oh, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And, and that's really all he preached. He preached, get ready. But behold, the Lamb is coming. He preached, repent, because he is coming. He preached that message. And on that day, I don't know if it was a day that that felt different to John. I don't know what that day when he awoke, if he had any idea in his mind that this was going to be the day. But somewhere along the line, John had been given a word from the same one that had told him to preach this message. The same voice that told him to baptize. And the same voice that told him to preach. And the same voice that called him to be a messenger, that voice said, you're going to see him and you're going to know him when you see him because when that moment comes, the spirit of the Lord is going to descend on him and you will recognize him and know him for what he is. And, and it's on this day that Jesus happens to be there. It's on this day that these two cousins meet for the first time since they were not even yet born. The last time that we know for a fact that they were together was was when their two mothers were carrying them in the womb. And these two young, young boys, nothing more than a fetus, were surrounding there in the amniotic fluid in the mother's belly. But when Mary came in contact with Elizabeth, it's like when those two people got in the same room, the Bible says that the John jumped in the womb and the Holy Ghost came to him and his mother began to prophesy. We know that the first time that they met, the fireworks happened. The first time that they came in contact, something powerful took place. And now, as far as we know, that was the last time they were ever together in one place at one time. Until this day comes that, that Jesus is walking down this dusty road. And on this day comes that John, who all he ever needed was water and a road. He didn't need, he didn't need a coliseum. He didn't need an arena. He didn't even need a pulpit. He needed two things. He needed a place where people were moving through and there was water nearby. That's all he required. And he began to preach and, and to lay down that message of repentance. And it's on that day that as he stands there in the water with John, the, we would later call the beloved and even later on call the revelator John. John is with him there in the water. They're baptizing people. And Jesus steps up to the scene. And, and Jesus begins to move through the crowd. And there, there could have been hundreds of people there on that day. But as Jesus begins to navigate his way through that crowd, he navigates his way toward the front, getting closer to the voice of his cousin, getting closer to the voice of this man. As he comes into view, it's as if the, the people parted to the left and the right. And, and John looks up and his eyes fall on this one who is called Jesus of Nazareth. And that was the last time they would ever call him Jesus of Nazareth because when he sees the face of Jesus, the Holy Ghost begins to rise up in him. And the Spirit of the Lord, the Bible says, comes down like a dove and lights above him. And John says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. And then the Bible says,
begins to carry out his, his earthly ministry. And from isolation, he walks down the banks of the Jordan River and steps into that muddy water where I have once stood myself. And as he steps into that water, if the spirit world hadn't caught on to it yet, this is not a biblical doctrine, but I believe, this is my interpretation, I believe that when Jesus' feet stepped into that water, that all of the spirit world stiffened and stood up because there was a, I believe there was an alarm that went through the entire spirit world because there's, it's not too often that something from heaven steps down to earth. And at this moment, I believe all the devils perk up their ears. I believe Satan himself stood from wherever he was and said, something just happened. Happened. Somebody from up there just stepped into this room. Somebody from heaven just stepped into this earth. They didn't know he had already been there for 30 years. But on that day when he got into the flow, on that day when he got into the Jordan, on that day when he stepped into the water that would be the water of baptism, when the foot of Jesus stepped in that water, I believe everybody realized something is getting ready to happen. Standing there in the flow, standing there in the water, standing there in the river of Jordan, standing there in that same river that has been chronicled so many times throughout the Old Testament and now is being chronicled and pinned into the history of the New Testament. They're standing there. It's not stagnant, but it's flowing. And, and Jesus is stepping in. And, and John is saying, I'm not worthy. And, and Jesus is saying, oh, yes, this has got to happen. This is, this is about to happen. This is what is supposed to take place. And they're standing there together in the water, in the flow, where Jesus is about to be anointed. He's going to be anointed in the words that were spoken, in the spirit that appeared like a dove, in the voice it's the, it's the moment when he is baptized that they stop calling him Jesus of Nazareth. But they begin to call him Jesus the, the Christos, Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah is come. It's, it's at this point that his identity is, is no longer in obscurity. It's at this point where everybody begins to seek him out and, and begin to want to know who he is and what is happening. And, and they will begin to follow him on the great signs and wonders and miracles that, that he was going to do. But the Bible teaches us that before any of that, that happens, when he, he leaves that moment, he leaves that flow, when he comes out of the water, he begins to enter into the wilderness, and he's not going in the wilderness because Satan wants him there. He's going into the wilderness because the Spirit of the Lord is taking him into the wilderness. Hallelujah. Now, you know, I, I, I don't know today how, how you feel about it, but I, I come from a long line of people who serve the Lord. Now, I got some elders in my family that, that are in their 80s and close to 90 years old, and when they tell the stories about how they came up in the Lord. And it's a little different than my stories, elders, and because my stories involve being in air-conditioned churches and, and padded pews, and I'm thankful for all that the Lord has done. I give honor to God for that. I never had to get baptized in the water of a pond or a river. I never went to a brush harbor. I don't even know if I can tell you what a brush harbor even is, but I remember hearing the stories of my grandparents who were literally shunned by their families when they accepted the oneness of God and, and baptism in Jesus' name. And they became outcasts for what they believed. I, I came up in a little different time. I, I came up in a time where we went to youth camps and youth conventions and we were proud of the fact that we could dress holy and, and live modest. And, and there was something about, I come up in a different age and I come up in a different time. Oh, I, I, I'm thankful for my heritage today. I'm thankful for what God has done in my life and the, and the way that he has led our life and the way he has put things together, but we know it wasn't always that way. Hallelujah. So there was a time when people had a little bit of a different spirit, when, when the spirit would begin to draw them, even if the spirit would draw them into trouble, that was okay. Even if the spirit would draw them into temptation, that was okay. Even if the spirit was drawing them into the wilderness, that was okay, because wherever you lead, Lord, that's where I follow. We got a little bit different spirit. Hallelujah. If you draw me to that car lot where I can get that new Mercedes, then I'll consider myself blessed and highly favored. It's a different kind.
kind of call that we want today. We, we, we don't mind preaching if it's a, a big crowd of people. We don't, we don't mind the excitement of, of PA systems and air conditioning. And that, that's the kind of church we like. That's the kind of, the kind of spirit we enjoy. And as long as I can wear nice suits and pretty clothes and pretty shoes, then that's okay. I, I like that kind of sacrifice, if you will. I like that kind of call. But we don't know nothing about the kind of call that says the spirit of the Lord led him into the wilderness. Hallelujah. What are you going to do when the Spirit of the Lord leads you into a hospital room? What are you going to do when the Spirit of the Lord leads you into a diagnosis? What are you going to do when the Spirit of the Lord leads you into a financial crisis or a problem on the job? Or the Spirit of the Lord leads you into a desert place? Because you see, sometimes when the Lord is getting ready to do something, He has a way of taking you places that you don't necessarily want to go.
by this time tomorrow we could be in World War III. It could happen just that quickly. The, the end of all things could turn and pivot that quickly and the whole world be in an uproar. What are we going to do with moments like this where we're on the edge? We're in the, in the, on the edge of the flow. I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to do what Jesus did. I want to get anointed for the attack. I want to take every opportunity to step down in the flow. We observe in nature an elemental dependence on water. We can't live without it. Some two thirds of our being is, is made up by water, over two thirds even. We cannot live without water. We can only go a certain period of time before our bodily functions and our very organs will cease to operate if we don't have water. We depend on water. We have to have water. Hallelujah. We observe in Scripture that there is a spiritual connection to water. There is a flow. There is a, a clear designated flow. And you can trace it all through the Scripture. There is a, a thread from Genesis to Revelation all through the Bible of how the, the water has been connected with each and everything that we do. The book of Psalms will start out in the very first chapter telling you that blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And after it tells you the, the character and, and description of, a, of what a blessed man is supposed to be like, then it begins to tell you what a blessed man looks like. Because then it says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. The Lord said, here's what a blessed man looks like. It looks like somebody that is firmly planted by the flow. Someone who is planted by the rivers of living water. That's what a blessed man is. So we see, not just in Psalm, we see it all through the Bible. We see a journey of how it begins. And on the very first page of your Bible, before anything is spoken, before anything is spoken to existence, before the plants, the animals, the sky, the trees, the the front of any of this, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the deep. Yeah. The first thing God did before he ever spoke, he stirred the water. Before yeah. he ever spoke, he stirred the water. I don't know if you've ever tossed a, a rock into a pond or, or you've, ever, you've ever dipped an oar into the river or the sea. When, when something goes in, there's a, immediately there's a reaction. It doesn't matter how small it is but, or how large it is, there's always a reaction when something goes in, when it is stirred, and when it is touched, it begins to create a flow and, and a momentum. There, there is a ripple effect that comes after that. And, and before God began to create anything, He He started to flow. He He moved. The Bible says He moved on the face of of the deep. Yeah. And, and the Bible will go on to teach us. And we're going to read all through the Scripture. We'll see that that Noah was instructed to build an ark because there's a flow coming. There's, there's a flow that's going to come, and you need that ark because the flow is going to lift that ark up. That, that ark is going to be a place of safety, and the ark and the flow are going to work together. Somebody thinking about leaving the church, you better change your mind and stay in the ark. Don't want to get out. Don't walk away from the ark because when the flow comes, the only thing going up is going to be the church. When the flow comes, the only thing that's going to lift off of this earth is going to be the church. Before Moses was ever able to be delivered in order to escape death, his mother put him in the water. She literally set him in the flow of the river. And, and then later for the Hebrews to escape in captivity from Egypt, the Bible tells that they had to go through the Red Sea. And, and the flow opened up as they, they go through the Red Sea. And later, many years, 40 years later, as they're going into the promised land, the Bible says that they've got to go through the, the Jordan, in fact, the Jordan River, the flow again. They've got, to, they've got to go through that flow. Hallelujah. I don't know if you've ever studied this, but the way I interpret it is simply this. The Bible teaches that when those priests begin to go through the Jordan River, as their foot begins to step in, every time their foot steps in, the water, it just stops. And the water begins to pile up like this. 
this. You see, when they the first time they went in the water, it was a Red Sea. And the Bible says that the Lord, he split it like this, and it opens and they walk in between it. But now they're not in a sea, they're in a river. They're, they're in a river. And, and as they go into the river, the water is still flowing. But it has stopped right there as they are going through. The, the water is flowing. It's just, it's just piling up because it's still flowing. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for a flow right now. Everybody, some, some historians and like Jewish traditions say that you can see the flow of Jordan from over 20 miles away because that's how long it took for them to walk through the Jordan River. That water was just piling up. But in order for them to get into the land of their promise, they had to go through the flow again. Hallelujah. When Abraham was, was promised the, the land, and he began to take, he began to walk through that land, and when he began to take possession of that land, the Bible says that everywhere he went, he began to dig wells. And, and he would dig wells, and, and out of this dry place, he would produce water out of the middle of nowhere. And, and the well would produce water, which would bring benefit, and it would bring wealth to that season. And, and Abraham taught us something there. that he, he taught us the principle that even the great cattle barons of the American Old West would later come to understand that he who controls the water controls the range. And everywhere Abraham went, he said, we're going to have some water here. And when there's water, this land is going to be better than it was before. And the Bible would tell us that when the Philistines many years later would fill those same wells with earth, that his son Isaac would come through. And the Bible says Isaac was led of the Lord. And he began to redig those wells to find out, yes, there is still water in the old well. Can I preach to somebody here tonight say, don't forget all that anointing that's come from our elders. There's a bunch of them here tonight. They went through things and they saw through things and they tapped into some, into some deep wells. You can try all this new stuff if you want to and I'm all about new method, but let me tell you, there's still some good fresh water in those old wells. They have, they have proven this stuff. Our doctors have proven this stuff.
down to the Jordan and dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. And we find that on that seventh time, he comes out and his skin is smooth like a baby. From smooth as the day was born, no leprosy ever, ever there again. Something is about, there's something happening all the scripture about getting that flow, just getting that water, and all we keep seeing the Jordan. Oh, no, get in the flow. We see the Jordan. Get in the flow. Get in the water. Get in there to the place where it's moving. Get in that place where the Holy Ghost is. And where the Spirit of God is moving, there's a there's a type of shadow weaved all the way through this Old Testament. And it's no surprise to me that when John the Baptist comes as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he brings that message of repentance, and he then he begins do. It's no surprise to me that he did what no prophet and no priest had ever done before because their baptism in the, those days of, of the Jewish law and order was simply just washing of the hands and washing of the feet. But, but John says, no, we're going to do something different. What we're going to do is we're going to repent. And, and there ain't enough water in that basin for you to get your whole body into it. So step on down here into this river. Step on down here to the Jordan. And John begins to do what no other priest or prophet has ever done when he says we are going to be baptized and baptized is our English word but the original word that John used was this, immersed, hallelujah he said you're going to get immersed in this water, you're going to go down in this water and when you come up it's going to signify a covering and a, and a washing away of sin it's no surprise to me that when baptism is introduced it's introduced with the feeling or rather it's introduced with the element of the water does anybody hear what I'm seeing here today? Isaiah described that sometimes the enemy wants to mimic the power of the Lord. We know that this Satan walks about, the Bible says, like a roaring lion, but he is not a roaring lion. Hallelujah. We understand that. So Isaiah, when he says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, we know that that's just another time and another way that the enemy is trying to use the Lord's stuff to get on the, against the Lord's people. But the, the enemy can't come in like a flood because he's not a flood. The flood comes from the Lord, and that's why the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Hallelujah. And you know, you can interpret that scripture even another way. You can look at that same verse and you can, you can realize that the original language, that, that same verse would have been written with no punctuation. So it was, it was kind of a little different when you take out all the commas and all of that and where it would say, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. You can also read it say like this. When the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. I don't care which way you interpret it or which way you say it. Here's what I know. It's God that's in control of the movement of the Spirit. It's God that's in control of the element of the water. Jesus would perform when they came to him and they said, we are out of wine. He said, just add water. Hallelujah. We ain't got no more wine. Just add some water. Because if you get some water, I can do something with it. Anybody here today want to drink from that Holy Ghost water? Please know that the devil don't like to be water. Hallelujah. That's 
why the Bible tells you this is Matthew chapter 12. The Bible tells you that when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he finds himself walking in dry places. Hallelujah. Because when the devil gets a hold of your life, here's what he's going to do. He's going to pull you as far away from the flow as he can get you. He's going to pull you far away from the river. He's going to pull you far from baptism. He's going to pull you far from the movement of the Holy Ghost. When the devil gets a hold of your life, that's why you quit going to church. Hallelujah. When the devil gets a hold of your life, you're not coming to no prayer meeting. You're not coming to midweek service because he's pulling you away. He don't want you to be able to get your toe into that water anymore. He don't want you to be able to get your spirit in, in, in the sleep of the spirit of the Holy Ghost. He wants to pull you away from the water. No, he wants to get you into a dry place. He wants to get you into a thirsty place. And when he encountered Jesus, he went to him in the wilderness. He didn't try to, he didn't try to tempt Jesus over there by the Jordan. He said, let me get him off over here in the middle of this desert where he's hungry and he's thirsty. And it didn't even matter because when the, when the Bible will teach us that when you really are ready to overcome the spirit of the Lord, overcome the spirit of the enemy, that the Lord will be water to you in a dry place. So you see here tonight, I'm preaching to us here that what Jesus had to do before he went into his attack, he had to get an anointing. And that anointing came when he goes down into that water. Hallelujah. We know that there's something happening here theologically. But the Bible is going to teach us in the book of John. John chapter 5 and verse 6. That this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is true. For there are three that bear heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the Bible says in verse 8, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And friends, that's why we don't do animal sacrifices anymore. We don't have to give no blood from no animal anymore. We get baptized in water, because when you get baptized in the water, the water is in agreement with the blood. They are one. Hallelujah. If I was in this house tonight, and I have to get baptized in the name of Jesus, I wouldn't even leave here. I wouldn't leave here without getting in the water. I wouldn't even leave here without stepping into the water. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't try out my car one mile without getting into the water. If you're here tonight, if you're hungry for more of God, step into the water right now. Too much to deal with. 
not to get into the flow. You got trouble on the job. You got to get into the flow. Can I tell somebody here today, if I was here tonight and I was struggling, the last thing I would do is stand on the sidelines and not let the flow of the Holy Ghost move me. I would do like Jesus did. And I would step into the flow.
Right now, in this altar, I want somebody to lift your hand. 